to Six Strings and Things, a guitar adventure. The place for all things guitar and gear. Here are your hosts, Chris, Jesse, and Robert. Welcome to episode 37 of Six Strings and Things, a guitar adventure, your fortnightly webcast for all things guitar and gear. I'm Chris, and with me is Jesse. Hello. And we are celebrating episode 37 because, why not? hey, it's a prime number. <laughs> Wait, it is. Yeah, this is not a math podcast, but you should know 37 is a prime number. But math affects everything. That's right. So we might as well celebrate it here and There's there. a lot of math and guitars. A lot of math. All right. So <laughs> hopefully we haven't just lost all of our listeners at this point. Um, so, Jesse, what have you been up to this week playing guitars? daddy i pen the playing guitars bit <laughs> so for those who are on audio only you wouldn't notice this so please go to youtube and check it out i uh really messed around with video stuff so i got some new video gear um i'm using my camcorder as video as my webcam and i have a green screen behind me so i have a nice um faux brick wall thing going on so please check out the video because I'm, I'm really pleased with this <laughs> but anyway um which left precious little time for actually playing guitar <laughs> so um yeah no i just uh, was reviewing some of the um six four three two basic jazz chord uh, string sets and all the inversions and um that's mostly it I did do a little bit of uh, looking at some pomp and circumstance four-part uh, harmony guitar. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I might work on that a little bit. But other than that. Yeah, well, I asked you because I figured you'd talk about video anyway because uh, you said pre-show that's what you've been working on uh, more than playing guitar. So Yeah, it's been a video kind of thing. So hey, it looks, new- looks great. And- yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, of course, what the viewers can't see is what I see, which is you sitting in front of a – Green screen <laughs> with a black border around it. Yes, <laughs> it's all special effects. That's right. You know, this could be Game of Thrones for all we know. That's right. But see, I had to do this because I had such a uh, kind of a junky room compared to your. You have a nice blue wall and guitars on it, and occasionally a dog that would wander in. I mean, I have nothing like that. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going with the brick wall. A superimposed a bunny rabbit or something. <laughs> Well, I've been uh, doing all kinds of different stuff, um, and we'll talk about sort of as a show topic what I've been spending most of my time on, but just a few other things. Working on the intro to Red House, I've got that to a place where I'm really happy with it, need to tweak Mm -hmm. a little bit. There's a a vibrato that starts the song, and uh, he basically he alternates between the first and third string and uh, vibratos that uh, and I'm still trying to get that to sound good because my problem is that when I do the vibrato, I, it just synchronizes with the picking, and that's not what Jimmy's doing on the recording. Mm-hmm. You know, the vibrato is at a different rate than the picking, so I'm trying to break that synchronization and get it to sound a little bit more like him. I'm not trying to be a carbon copy of Jimi Hendrix by any measure, but I would like to get a little bit of that style under my fingers. Um, yeah, yeah, that and the bend vibratos and things like that, you know, just kind of polishing them up a little bit. That's kind of difficult because your hands sort of want to synchronize naturally. Yeah, it's really you know? hard not to synchronize. Yeah. And so especially because, um, you know, being a physicist, we study the synchronization as actually a branch of physics. And so I'm trying to break that and trying to like, you know, right. it feels really foreign to me. Um, yeah. So working on that, I've been working on um, chord progressions two five one, mm-hmm. and uh, trying to. I mean, still work, I've been working on those now for about a month, but I'm feeling pretty comfortable about those different chord voicings for the seventh chords. You know, different things like that. I've been trying to go, and we'll talk more about this later. But I'm trying to go back a little bit and um, sort of fill in some gaps that I basically have from along the way. I think it's good every once in a while look back to what you already know and say, okay, where am I weak and what don't I know and try to fill in those holes. You'll never fill them all in. Right. Right. Um, And and no instructor can possibly ever tell you everything. True. Right. There's always, because there might be gaps in the instructor's knowledge or it might be, you know, they might have just simply 
didn't think about covering that with you and then moved on to the next thing and it got lost. There's all kinds of reasons why, you know, there's gaps sure. in knowledge, whether you're with an instructor or not with an instructor. So it's good just to look back, I think, every once in a while and just, you know, get your bearings and figure out sort of uh, where you are in guitar. It's kind of what I've been doing the last couple of weeks. Yeah, that's good. It's too. It's also true that when you revisit stuff, I mean, you, you sort of pick up things that maybe you skimmed over and maybe thought you had and didn't really get them as deeply. And it's like, oh, now you're drawing connections. Yeah, you know. Yeah, well, that's cool. Yeah, and your ear gets better with time, and so you go back to the old stuff. Like, oh, it didn't sound quite right. And when you first did it, it might have sounded really good because you didn't know any better. Right. Right. And so it's like, oh, well, OK, that sounds good now or it doesn't sound awful. I need to work on this. And so, yeah, absolutely. It's it's definitely worthwhile um, going back to the basics here and there. Um, so any birthdays this week? I didn't look them up. All right. No problem. <laughs> I apologize, people. <laughs> I'll hit you twice as many next time. <laughs> all right. Yeah, yeah. No worries. No worries at all. All right. So uh, I thought we talked today about um, guitar lesson books um, because – I've been using them a lot at last few weeks to sort of fill in those gaps and to go back mm -hmm. through things that I already know and I've come across things I didn't know. Um, and so I thought what we would do is talk about the different types of lesson books out there. There's no sort of formal categories. I'm totally making these categories up, by the way. But just to get a sampling of, of you know, what's out there, what people can use. And I think probably the, the type of book most people are familiar with are tab books. Yeah. Right. And those can be, you know, by genre, you might have top 10 rock guitar songs from 1975. Right. That might be a book or you might have a complete catalog of Eric Clapton. Probably wouldn't have that all in one book, but you might have an album. Those are pretty common. Right. So you might have Metallica's Ride the Lightning book, which right. I looked at that. I was going to get that. I was going to work on Fade to Black and I couldn't bring myself to pay 20 bucks for a book with eight songs in it. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, oh, yeah. That's, that's a bit much. Well, it's eight songs, but it is a full album. I mean, it is. Some of them are fairly long. And yeah. 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 And it's fairly, you know, then too, it's also they're fairly involved. I mean, I can imagine stuff like Metallica or, or even the prog rock stuff like Dream Theater or something. So you, you, there might be five songs on the album or something, but it's like, yeah, but it takes a long time to tab that stuff out. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Not like you're tabbing Dylan or something. Right. No, no, I totally appreciate that. I was thinking sort of as a song to cost ratio. And, and I actually true. want to learn all those songs on Fade the Black uh, or Ride the Lightning. Um, so it's like, uh, I don't think I could. I'm not, I'm going to go with online tabs for uh, <laughs> Fade the Black if I ever want to learn that song. Yeah. Because I think either that or For Whom the Bell Tolls would be the, the two songs that I would really want to learn off that album. I can't think of anything else that I'd want to. Put the effort into. Um, Ride the Lightning itself is good. Yeah. It's like a good song. One. Just don't want to learn yeah. how to play it. Yeah, it's true. So, but for whom the bell tolls sure is worth learning, though. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> That's, just, you know, the classic uh, mosh metal yeah. of the era, you know? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. So, tab books aside, I think most people have a sense of what they are, know how to use them so on and so forth. Uh, I thought we would break up books in a couple other categories. Um, and in no particular order, I would, I would say we could start with something like lesson books. And mm -hmm. they are books where um, there is a limited amount of material in them, possibly, and they focus on one thing. And so they're not, they might have tabs in them, but the point isn't to necessarily learn songs from those books. Right. And I've talked about a couple of books on the show before for this one video, I'll hold up the book. Uh, but blues you can use by John Ganapes. That has been a really good book for me. Uh, I started with this book. So probably the first book I worked through on guitar. Yeah. I remember you talking about this when you got it like yeah. years ago. Yeah. And it's a fantastic book. It's set up like a lot of lesson books are set up. Um, instead of chapters, there's lessons. And then, you know, I'm looking at lesson 10 right now. Uh, there's scales. And in this particular, uh, thing they're talking about um the pentatonic patterns and then it goes into chords and progressions talks about seventh and ninth chords and the blues progression using those chords different variations and then at the end of that particular lesson there is a song that's tabbed out this one's called lazy day blues and it's a um you know short song probably 20 bars maybe if that 
probably not even that. And um, it's tabbed out. You can play along with it. You can listen to the recording and you can learn the various sort of techniques taught in the lesson through the song. Right. So it's a nice sort of structure. A lot of the books do this kind of thing where you have a chance to, you know, you read, you learn something, and then you have a chance to actually put it in practice through one of these mm-hmm. solos. And really the point of those solos is not to learn the solo so much as it is to sort of get the experience of those techniques under your fingers. Yeah. I mean, and that makes a lot of sense. I mean, there's some uh, online stuff, too, that's similar where uh, this is in the style of this song or solo or person or whatever. So it's just you can get certain techniques, whether it be a vibrato or, you know, whatever it might be, a lick, a scale. Right. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Quite valuable. And there are other types of lesson books out there, too, that are I would call them less uh, playing oriented, if you will, uh, and more mm-hmm. like, you know, music theory. So right. there might be tabs out there, and there might be tabs in the book, but that's really not the point of that book. It's even less the point of the book in some ways than the blues you could use type thing, where you know you're actually going over what what chords, you know, what's the chord progressions, or what scales do you play over certain chords, and these kinds of things. Right. Um, in fact, a lot of times those are not even um, guitar oriented. I mean, like uh, I think it's Levine wrote this uh, jazz theory book. Um, I can't remember the exact name of it. <laughs> I will put it in the show notes. But uh, and it's mostly piano oriented because I'm assuming he's a uh, pianist. Um, and it's you know the voice leading and it tells you what's going on. But it'll have like the music staff. It'll have you know piano stuff. But it doesn't. It's not specific to guitar. So you actually have to sort of think about how to apply that specifically to guitar and, and which can be good too because yes. it makes you think more about where the notes lie on the guitar. You already sort of have to have that fretboard in your mind, that map. Uh, and if you don't, you got to go learn it to even get anything from the, you know, specific from the book. But it's a great exercise to do. So I would recommend that, you know, once you're able to do that. Mm-hmm. Um, for beginners who, you know, it's just, I'm just starting guitar and I'm not really, I don't have the fretboard memorized. Then that's kind of step one. You got to do that. Um, but yeah, there's all kinds of levels. I mean, and then from there you can go up to, um, taking apart solos on different instruments and, you know, saxophone solos or whatever right, you know, people right. do. Can you turn a saxophone, transcribe a saxophone control, uh, solo to your guitar or whatever? And, yeah, sure. yeah. And, you know, there are but there are music theory books for guitar out there as well. That you can yes, that's true. I have a couple of those. Um, some are better than others. Um, I can't think of a recommendation I would have off the top of my head for a particular book, music theory for guitar. Um, but they, they are then tabbed out because you can see, for example, this is the major scale pattern on the guitar. And then you can talk about, you know, when you move from one string to the next, you, you're going through a fourth, except for obviously um, the uh, G string to the B string. Uh, but mm-hmm. it's a nice uh, sort of layout for people to see. And again, you're not trying to learn songs out of this book. You're trying to understand songs out of these books. And right. that can be quite helpful. Um, another type of lessons book I thought I'd point out is one that I've been working through. Um, and it's this one. Those, of course, those of you on video can see the cover. This is Blues Guitar for Dummies by John Chappell. Chap- excuse me, John Chappell. And uh, I got this book in 2011 when I first started playing guitar. And I could not understand this book. Like, I, 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 the first few pages, I'm like, wow, you really have to have some kind of understanding of the instrument, how to play the instrument before you get into this book. And, uh, and that's gotta be frustrating when you get the book for dummies and you can't get anything out well, of it. Well, to be fair, had I read the preface, um, before jumping in, it does mention that, you know, you, there are certain things you should know before getting into the book. <laughs> I mean, it does start at a pretty basic level about the various parts of the guitar and whatnot, but the, um, tabs the, the or the bits of songs that they cover pretty early in the book are i think pretty complicated for a straight up beginner and mm-hmm. if you had a year under your belt you'd probably be fine with uh with starting by to play some of these things maybe maybe even six months depending on sort of how much time you spent but what i've liked about this book is it's given me the opportunity to go back and work through some of the most basic stuff and, remind, right. and, and see what things I've missed. And there were some things I've missed along the way. He's got this great chapter on rhythm guitar. And rhythm is, is definitely one of my weaknesses. And it has been nice to go through and see some different strumming patterns, see some different rhythm ideas. Uh, and, you know, at this point, they're not hard for me to play. 
in 2011, they were quite difficult for me to play. Sure. Right? Now I can yeah. look at it and say, oh, okay, he's just doing this chord voicing or that chord, or, you know, or whatever the case might be. Back in 2011, I was like, okay, see, I got to fret the first fret and then the second fret. And how do I put my fingers there? There was not, a, now I can look at it and say, okay, this is a B7. Okay, fine. And right. yeah, and now I'm looking, so I'm looking at completely different things. Um, so these beginner books, even if you've been playing for a while, are can still be quite helpful um, mm -hmm. and, and in that context. Right now I'm at the point where, you know, with this book, um, I'm on this chapter eight where it's called Beyond the Basics, Playing Like a Pro, Lead Soaring Melodies and Searing Solos. And I guess I guess my solos will be searing when I'm done with this chapter. I don't know. Um, but uh, what's nice about it is I can skim a lot of it. Right. Yeah. Because I already know a lot of this. I don't, I don't have to learn the pentatonic patterns. I don't have to learn these things. But what I can focus on are, oh, you know, you know, if you put this note in here, it adds a little bit of spice to it. And that's because you're playing the major third uh, right. of, the, of, the, of the one chord. And I'm like, oh, OK, that's nice. And then, you know, he points out just the um, in the scale of E and, and sort of the first pentatonic pattern that most people learn. But been able to say, okay, what would that be in A? And where would that note be in the, you know, pattern four or however you want to call the patterns, you know, pentatonic patterns. Yeah. Um, which I wouldn't have been able to do certainly back in 2011. Right. Yeah. So I'm getting very different things out of this book and I'm looking forward to going through the rest of it. Um, and talking about, you know, more soloing ideas and, uh, all these different types of blues that he covers and whatnot. So it should be should be an interesting book to go back to. I'm glad I did not get rid of it like two years ago because it was collecting dust on my shelf. I'm glad I had this stuff. <laughs> well, good on you. Yeah, two weeks ago I was like, I was looking through my shelf. I'm like, geez, what haven't I looked at in a while? But hey, this book. Let's give this book a shot. Yeah, it's not not that that's actually that doesn't sound like a beginner beginner book anyway. But I mean, but um, I, I like to go through some of the beginner stuff. I know when I had I don't have a guitar player subscription anymore, but when I did, and they had beginner columns too, and you always read through them because you sometimes pick up just like little things that would oh, I didn't even know that you know, and it just kind of fills maybe a little hole you didn't even realize you had. Yeah. Or made you think about something else, you know, in a different way where it just kind of makes a connection. Yeah. And that's kind of what we do, you know? Yeah. So. No, I mean, I had, I had, a, I'll give you an example, one of those moments today, um, and actually it wasn't with a book, it was with my guitar instructor. We were talking about mm -hmm. pentatonic scale and then the um, minor seventh arpeggio. Mm -hmm. And he's made this comment, oh, you know, the minor seventh arpeggio is the same as the minor pentatonic scale with one note missing. Mm -hmm. and I thought, yeah. I say I know how to play both, and I've been playing both for a long time, but I never made that connection. I always thought, hey, these are similar, and I, and I my mind stopped there, right? Right. And when anybody he, he made it overlap, I'm like, oh yeah, okay. And you know, things I've been playing for a while, and for whatever reason, just didn't pair up in my mind. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's it's that's the thing about guitar, right? It's like an onion. You That's keep true. Peeling layers away, but you should go back to what you've peeled away every once in a while because there's interesting gems in there too. Um, That's true. Yeah, good stuff. Uh, the last type of book I thought we talk about real quick, um, and I just pulled one off my shelf at random. I have a bunch of these too because um, I spend entirely way too much money on guitar and guitar related stuff. Um, is that is that actually philosophically possible to spend too much guitar or money on guitar stuff? Well, you know what they say. That's another discussion. Yeah, how many guitars do you need? <laughs> Just one more. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, that's another discussion. Um, I found a book that is called 101 Must Know Blues Licks. So not just 100, it's 101. Must, and, one. and, and you must know them, must know them all. A quick, Don't leave off that last one. <laughs> that's right. A quick, easy reference for all guitarists. And this is by Wolf Marshall. Um, this is another, okay. yeah, and I'll call, what well, we call this Lick Books? Because that's yeah. an awful name. And uh, basically what these books contain, as the name suggests, are licks. Right. And there's different yep. ways that you can go about learning these. Usually the books have a CD that you can then listen to and hear what's supposed to sound like before you start playing. Um, this is pretty well done because he has two versions of each lick. He has a slow version and a fast version. So he plays the normal speed first and then right immediately after that is a slower speed. 
And that will mm-hmm. give you a chance to sort of work your way up to speed without having to, you know, break out VLC or any tune or some other, you know, app to do. Uh, that was my dog. And we're back. All right. Uh, <laughs> But Wolf Marshall, as we were talking about, has this book, 101 Must Know Blues Licks. Uh, as I was saying, there's two versions of each lick. And what's nice about this book, and I, and I wish that more books did this, and many do, but not all, it's one track per lick. And so some books will have, like, multiple tracks on uh, – multiple licks on one track. And they'll say, like, you know, track 47, 30 seconds in. That's mm-hmm. kind of a hassle. I'd rather just click on track 37, let it play, and it's just that component. Um, Set it on repeat. <laughs> yes, exactly. You know, I, I would much rather do that, but not all – I guess there's you know, reasons why people can't do that. But um, anyway, 101 Must Know Blues Licks. Now, there's different ways you can go about these kinds of books. You can commit these licks to memory, all right, one at a time, um, which is okay, I guess. I like to use them in a different way. Um, I don't memorize them. I don't play them again and again and again until I memorize them. I like to see Mm -hmm. what's going on. And uh, all right. So, okay, there's a bend here followed by, you know, this note, whatever the case might be. And um, that gives me sort of a sense of the style as opposed to just memorizing. I have memorized some of these licks. Don't get me wrong. You do have to memorize some things, right? Sure. Yeah. I like to dissect them and see, okay, you know, where does this bend sound good? Because this book will tell you, you know, this is over the one chord or this is, you know, over a quick change or whatever the case might be. And that kind of gives you a bigger picture than having just memorized 101 must know licks. Uh, That's a good point. One of my first guitar books was a uh, uh, guitar rock licks. I think that was actually the name of it. It It's as generic as you get. And it came with a CD. Uh, It's been so long, I don't remember how it was like arranged. Um, But it didn't really give you the context of where you'd put the licks. It's just, here's another one. Here's another one. Here's another. And I I think there were some in there. Again, it's been a couple decades now. But it's like, I think there were some in there that were standard stuff that you'd hear on like, it, you know, Angus Young would play or something like that. But you, it wasn't immediately obvious because they didn't really talk about the context. Whereas, you know, when you're like you're saying, it's like it says, here's where you'd apply it. It makes a lot more sense. Yeah. Are there tracks like uh, a backing track kind of thing in there where you can apply them or not, not really? on this one? Other books that I Does have that, do have those. That is cool. Yeah. So you get the lick, and then it's like, and here's where you use it. Here's a backing track, and then you do it, and you sound all boss. Yeah. Um, this yeah. this book, it's it's I would say minimal information. Um, it basically will tell you, you know, here's a the first lick. It, he says a basic scale, the C mixolydian, and it basically is played in the first four bars in a in a blues mm-hmm. in C. Um, and what's what is nice about this book though is they he broke up the licks by style so there's a chapter on pre-war electric blues then there's another Mm -hmm. chapter on you know modern chicago and texas blues another chapter on you know rock blues whatever the case might be they suggest some recordings along the way he even says in these little paragraphs what he played through when Mm -hmm. making these um licks and this you know for example talks about how he plays through an ES-335 and a Soldano amp for this particular okay. list. All right. Yeah. Trying to sort of mimic the particular time period, what these people were playing when they were playing those licks. Um, mm-hmm. So that's actually, I shouldn't say minimal information. There's a lot of, kind of quite a bit of information there um, when it, in regards to how he sort of made the sounds right. you know, to make these licks. Um Probably should get, you know, 101 must know rock licks just to sort of round out the collection. Um, sure. You know, I have another book on blues licks that is by artist. So licks mm-hmm. in the style of BB King, Albert King, you know, Monty yeah. Peters, whatever the case might be. I think the best way of using these books, though, is not memorizing a whole bunch of licks. You got to memorize some because you got to, you know, you got to play something. Um, but it's, uh, I think, more important to understand the context and get to the point where, you know, you can take that C Mixolydian lick or whatever, pre-wars blues lick, and say, hey, can I play it in B? Right. Right. Or am I able to play that in E now? B would be kind of cheesy. So let's do E, right? Can I do that in yep. E? And can I do it 
uh, instead of down here on the neck, can I play it up on the neck a little higher? Does it work? And across across different strings. Right, across. Because like to do the same exact shape in a different key so you're on a different position in the neck, that's one thing. It'll get your finger spacing. Sure. But to be able to do it, like, you know, if it's something between, you know, the top three strings and you've got that interval spacing, it's going to sound a lot different if you do it an octave lower on lower strings and it's a different spacing. Yeah. But that also will train your ear and your, you know, your head to just move around that sort of thing. Absolutely. And, and I mean, while you certainly could get the book and just memorize the licks, I, you wouldn't be getting your money's worth out of the book. Right. Right. Because you could get a lot deep, deeper once you're comfortable, once you know enough guitar to move to different keys, different strings, different voicing, you know, these different kinds of things. Um, and it takes time to do that. And, and a beginner who is, you know, playing for just a few months who finds this book at their local music store might say, oh, wow, you know, I got to know these licks uh, because the title mm -hmm. says must know. And so, uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it told right. me <laughs> and, and, and nothing but to say, no, just play these licks. And that's great. That's a great place to start. Um, but, you know, don't shortchange yourself. You know, there's a lot to go through and it's worth taking it to your instructor and saying, I've got this book. What else can I do with it? You know, I've got the page 10. What else can I do with this book or whatever the case might be? Sure. Um, so a lot of, a lot of, um, a lot more uses for these books than it would first appear. And it definitely took me time to figure that out as a guitar player. Cause I certainly, you know, several years ago it was, can I play these licks? And that was it. You know, I wasn't thinking of, can I play this C lick and E? And I really apologize folks for those noises in the background. Uh, if they're picking up by my microphone, we're a professional outfit here. <laughs> so, um, Jesse, do you have any uh, concluding comments that you'd like to make about the books in general? Have you had any books that you've really liked in the past that stand out? I didn't have a whole lot. Like as far as lick books, the only one I have is that rock guitar licks one. And then I had like a chord dictionary. This is like beginner stuff. So they had like the open chords and the basic um, – uh, what am I saying? Basic bar chords. Um, my favorite books, the ones that I would dig into for hours, and this was when I was a beginner, was um, the songs of the 70s. And then there's the songs of the 60s. And, and the, the thing is, this was before Tab even became like a big thing. Um, you can you can look at these. There, uh, Milton Oak and, um, has a whole series of these kind of things, 60s, 70s, 80s, probably 90s and, and the aughts now, um, although I haven't looked at them since then, you know, earlier. So uh, – but they were huge books that had uh, a lot of songs um, in piano sort of arrangements with like the guitar chords above the, you know, the piano arrangement. And a lot of the chords were not really the right – they were the basic right chords, but they weren't necessarily the right inversions or shapes or whatever. Um, but big collection of a lot of stuff of a genre, you know? So like the songs of the 70s, they had all kinds of John Denver and, you know, Jim Croce and, you know, whatever. <laughs> Skyrockets in flight. Or it's like, and I liked a lot of that stuff at the time. So, I mean, well, I still do. But uh, and so you just sit and you just play forever. And I think that was the thing for me is like – at the time, I mean, there was just no way to get that stuff. So I would sit for hours. Right. Now it's probably that kind of book is maybe less of a big deal because you can go out to Google, you know, you can Google afternoon delight and you can have five different versions of the chord progression or whatever. Right. So, um, yeah, I, I think books now are probably more for the specific stuff that is gathered together in one place, like licks and how to apply them theory, of course, would be good. Um, I don't have any specific recommendations, but you know, follow your heart and follow the uh, the uh, reviews on Amazon or wherever you buy them. Right, right, yeah. Or somebody who you know who knows about that particular uh, book. Absolutely. Yeah, you know, I visit your local music store. Usually, they have a rack. Yeah, so. <laughs> big rack too. Usually, chock full of books. And I would, I still like tab books. I know that there's lots of tabs out there on the internet, but you know what? I find that if I'm on a mobile device, some of those sites are really a pain because they redirect you to app stores to buy the, the app or whatever. Yeah. Or um, they're just the screens, not the good size. Or I want to play um, an instructional video about that song side by side with looking at the tab. I find right. that for me, that's by far the best way to learn. Sure. And, and and generally speaking, the ones that are in published books are more correct. Yes. I mean, you can have good ones that are perfect, you know, online that somebody did. Um, 
but I think your batting average is better in the published stuff by a good margin. And and I know I sound like a Luddite when I say this, but there's something about sitting on the sofa yes. <laughs> with a book. <laughs> you know, I don't know why that is. Maybe I'm old, I'm old but there it is. <laughs> yeah, no, I agree. I mean, because even the with the, I, mean, I was talking about using my iPad a lot with, with, for learning guitar. It's just, I'd rather have the book in front of me. And a lot of times yeah. the books with the tab, they have the rhythm above it. You know, so they have it. These are That's quarter true. notes or these are half notes or whatever the case might be. And, you know, on the Internet, it's just a line of numbers. That's true. And, of course, yeah. you, know, you should be listening to the song while you're learning how to play the song. And, you know, you mm-hmm. can get over some of that. But I just find still the notation to be quite, quite helpful. Yeah. I'll agree. So, all right. Well, listeners, if you have books that you would like to recommend, please leave them in the comments on the YouTube video, or you can email us, uh, SST at gestercat.com. I believe that's one of our email addresses that work. Also six strings and things at gmail.com would also get us, uh, um, your information. If you have a show, um, suggestion, we'd love to hear it. Uh, otherwise you're going to just hear what Jesse and I feel like talking about from one week to the next. Um, if you like what you heard tonight, please, uh, subscribe. However, you're listening to us, you can follow us on Twitter at SST show. And until then, just keep picking and grinning. Six strings and things of guitar adventure is a Jester Cat production. For more on this show, please visit www.jestercat.com. You can follow us on Twitter at SST show, and you can email the show at six strings and things at gmail.com. Thanks to Jesse for playing the intro music. Mm-hmm.